Yes, ladies and gentlemen, I am your host for today, Rick Turpin. Uh, we will be doing a sequence of Propertarian lectures today, uh, for the purpose of you, the viewers, to <laughs> listen in. My particular subject matter today, I'm going to be discussing about the Bronze Age collapse through to the early Iron Age. The reason I'm picking this subject matter is because it is, I think, of critical importance to understand why our culture in Western Europe is the way it is. So I'm going to start off first with explaining how the Bronze Age was relative to what comes next, the Iron Age. Uh, so obviously the, the Bronze Age, when we're talking about the Mediterranean Bronze Age, we would say Indo-European people, Mycenae Greeks, we'd call them. This is the same sort of people who were in the time of the Iliad, when the book's been, well, it was written in the Iron Age, but it's talking about events at the end of the Bronze Age. The, the crucial thing is to understand is, is how Greek civilization was radically different than the Middle Eastern world and the Egyptian world. In the Egyptian world, because they had one river source, it was easy, in a sense, to collectivise around that. Compare it to somewhere like Europe, where you've got loads of different river valleys, different ge geographies. It's harder in Europe for one guy to rule it all. That's the key to it. So in Egypt, the, the way they went down to cultural development was to say, this guy now, he might have figured out a way of, like, you know, predicting the climate, knowing when to plant the crops. That in itself, you know, he's used information that he knows. He's not told everyone else. He, and then in a sense, becomes a god. Only he knows this. So in Egypt, it's, we go down a political route of the king becomes a god and he becomes absolute. There isn't property ownership in the same way we have it in the Western European world later on. We have a situation whereby the pharaoh will lock you to do something. So in the Egyptian world, it's very top down. It's the guy becomes a god. In the Middle East, the way their culture went relative to the Greeks and the Egyptians was that God told me so. So the idea is you're a king of a city-state, like Hammurabi in the case. This is the same like the Mosaic law. It fits into the Middle Eastern model, like Hammurabi's law code, whereby you know, might be the king, but God told me. Now that gives me the authority. So Egyptians are gods. The Middle Eastern kings, God told me so. What's the difference with the Greeks? The difference with them is, and it's very unique, I've not seen another culture like this. They say there was from the gods. They're the sons and daughters of the gods. So in a weird sense, it's like every other culture in the world had a god and you were lower than them. In the Greek world, you're all equals. You know? You're the sons of Hercules, you're the sons of Perseus. Because like I say, in the world, they believed, like I said, they were not only descended from the gods, but then like the gods, they could decide for themselves. They are their own sovereigns, they are their own authority. So what you find in early Greek history, for instance, or we'll compare this to the Iliad now, which is your baseline of Western thought. Um, you have a situation whereby there's a guy who's in the role of a king, but he doesn't isn't like a pharaoh. All he can do is he organises things. He has become the de facto commander of the forces. But if you compare, let's say, in the Iliad, the king, um, Agamem Agamemnon, which is known as a wanax. In Greece, you had Basileus, which is the, the um, word for a king. In Greek words, then you have to higher than that, which is one axe. This was Agamemnon's role. It meant that when he was on the battlefield, yeah, he had a higher up pecking order than the other men. When he was at Rome, he would have been the same as anyone else. He's just, just like everyone in this lecture all now, for instance, like if we were all Basileus, we were equal. But if you put me in the role of one axe, that just means that yeah, I'm issuing instructions, you know, follow my lead. But when we're back home, just the same as you guys, Basileus. One, again, one of the reasons for this is unlike the Middle Eastern world, whereby it was like the Tigris and Euphrates or the Nile, Greek geography is very diverse. You've got river valleys, you've not got one centralised river system. So again, it's very, very difficult for one guy to rule all this. You had, example, in the Mycenaean Greek age, rather than having one centre of power, you had many. So there was like Argos with the Mycenaeans, you had Athens, which strangely enough survives through the Bronze Age. Everyone else in Greece disappears or becomes someone else. Uh, and in this Mycenaean world, what they did is they fortified hilltops. And you notice as well, early cultures in Greece don't live next to the sea. Because if you look at the Greek peninsula, it's obviously very open to attack from the sea, piracy and things. So normally a culture like this, close as the sea to the camp to facilitate trade and other things. The Greek world, how they did trade and other things, very far away from the sea. This, as time goes on, what happens is, is so in the Mycenaean time frame, there is, you could argue, more centralisation. There is, for example, there could be 10 kings in the role of like a furrow or someone who's like the top boss. 
What happens is as we come to a period called the Bronze Age, collapses, radical changes. We no longer have like Agamemnon as the one axe. You have literally becomes an aristocracy. We think so. The story of the event, what happens is obviously we've gone from the Neolithic period. We get to like, see, I don't want to go into that per se because it's sort of a standard for every culture in the Neolithic age. But once we get to the Greek world, it is a definite transition for the worlds around us. And it is, it is strictly unique. I, again, never seen anything like this in the history books where people can decide their own fate and where they are the sons and daughters of the gods. The, again, the baseline of all this, where do we get our information about Mycenaean Greece? Uh, again, there's archaeology. That's always your baseline we should look at. But what we find is, is again, the book, The Iliad, our oldest Western literature. Admittedly, Homer didn't pen this down on the same day that he come up with the story. He was a rhapsode. He added no bad, he added to the stories it went. So again, what we find in the Iliad is there's some hints of true history throughout it. So for instance, Troy, a um, good example, was thought of a myth. All historians just assumed Troy's just a literal device like Camelot. Turns out it's actually real. And that really threw historians because they thought, oh, wait a minute, is there more to Homer's Iliad that's real? Another instance is cities in the Greek world Obviously, we know the names from archaeology because you can go back through the record, you might find a rock with a name on it. In Homer's day, these cities were already burned and destroyed, and he was able to map out the ancient Greek world prior to the collapse and give it names. It was only limited archaeology later that it confirmed these places. So some of these areas were lost to time, and then the archaeologist does it and goes, wait a minute, it's exactly as Homer said. Yet Homer didn't know that. So we think what's going on is, is Homer's Iliad is a early distant memory of the Bronze Age. So, for example, it does talk about, we know Agamemnon's a real person, we know that there was a battle with Troy. But again, the another instance of how the Iron Age, the Bronze Age echoes might be slightly wrong, chariot warfare. In the Greek world in Homer's Iliad, it is just a, uh, an advanced taxi service. Men get a chariot to the front line, you do your fighting, jump back in your chariot and go on. That's not how chariots were used. Yet Homer says they were used as taxis. So we know in Homer's time frame, they would have had a memory of chariot warfare. They might have seen the odd inscription, the odd relic, but we had no idea it was practically used. So when we read the Iliad, yeah, we, we get a hint of chariot warfare, but it's never exactly as it was done. Another instance, how it, again, these Bronze Age echoes have been distorted. Like I mentioned, the Bronze Age kings more or less like ruled, like, I, I would call it now, like, say, the, Temples, the cities were on a grander scale than anything later on. They were said, from the Iron Age perspective, they said anything built, built in the Bronze Age must be Cyclopean, must be a Cyclops who made it, because only they could make stones this big. The entire culture were lost to these people. They even said the Greek world, once we're in the Bronze Age and it goes to the Iron, it is, other cultures don't have the same problem, but Greece, apart from religion, has more or less a clean slate. So in Western Europe, this is, we've gone from, like I said, the tyranny of the Bronze Age, whereby Kings, I mean, in a sense, the same thing with writing. The kings did have a lot of authority, even though obviously they were nowhere near as powerful as a pharaoh. But again, everything was centralised, these hilltop forts. For example, scribes and literacy. Language in linear A and B, we're talking maybe up to 100 characters. That's a lot bigger than your 25 modern letters of the alphabet. This makes learning very difficult to do unless you've got a centralised scribal class. So in Egypt, they did this. In Middle East, they did this. In Greece, they had it. But the problem is, is once the Iron Age kicked in, once the systemic collapse began, reading and writing disappeared. We go from the Greeks copying Minoan, making a Greek version of it called Linear B. And then that language, which was used for like accounting, we know it's funny. We actually know one of the early names of pets in Greece, Blackie the cow, because it says on the little thing, it says such a farmer, all became so many cows, one's called Blackie. So it kind of gives us a hint at like how personal this world was as well. But again, everything was done through the king's office, scribes. If you wanted to plant something, if you wanted to, the king wanted you, compelled you to do something. You didn't, you were given the crops, you planted the thing, you didn't know how it worked. Like reading and writing, you knew the people could do it, but you couldn't do it yourself. So again, when the collapse does happen, information is just reset back to zero again on a grand scale. What the Greeks do later on, so they go for a period in this dark age of no reading and writing at all. This is what we think the Iliad, how it was formed, because it was more than likely based off word of mouth. You know, 
Chinese whispers, so to speak. But the difference with the Iliad is, is even though it's ancient and it's well removed, Homer did not live when the Bronze Age collapse happened. However, we know he must have had information that was relatively accurate because, again, Troy was a myth until they refound it. All the cities in the Iliad and in the Odyssey, a lot of them were lost to time, get refound later. So it proves that Homer must be basing this on some fact. Um, another instance of how we get these Bronze Age echoes being slightly wrong. In the Bronze Age, like I said, these kings have absolute power. In the Iliad, kings, you notice, are farmers. The wives are spinning flax. This isn't what Mycenaean kings did. It's not what, what the wives did. What Homer's doing when he's looking at kings, he's actually remembering the Iron Age. So even though he knows the names, but Agamemnon, he was a Wanax, he ruled in Mycenae. He's got the idea wrong. He makes Agamemnon out like a farmer or like he says, his wife's spinning wool. Because in, in the Odyssey is a good example of this. Odysseus, he's like the big, the big badass from the Odyssey, he, from the Iliad, because like Odyssey's part two of the Iliad. He comes back to his island and he knows that his dad's still alive and running a farm. This isn't how Bronze Age kings did work. So again, what we think is going on is as the Iron Age is happening, we're actually seeing the restructuring of society again. We go from an absolute all-powerful king to an aristocracy based upon the, I think the... Well, there were several kinds in ancient Greece. You had people who survived the Bronze Age. This would have been people like in Athens. They even brag, we was here before the moon was invented which I think is quite cute, really. And so the rest of Greece were invaded by, like I say, Dorian barbarians. But the people in um, Attica in Greece, in Athens, were actually strangely the actual remnants of the Bronze Age collapse. And again, they've got this Athenian big-headedness about them because obviously like, they're better than these dirty Dorians like the Spartans. The, the, again, the Iron Age, the, sorry, the Mycenaean aristocracy, some of them would have survived. Some of them, by a force of arms, sheer will alone, would have been able to hold some stretch of land and still be the old aristocrats. Yet there would have been newcomers. And these people, like today, looking like, say, the, the Viking invasion is a good example of this. People come to a country, conquer it, end up changing things. But like I say, after a period, you become accepted as a ruler. No one turns around and says, you're an interloper, get lost. Eventually, these people, the Dorian invaders, mixed in with the old Mycenaean aristocrats, end up forming a world whereby like, they accept, you know, you may have stolen this recently, but by force of arms, sheer will, you've kept it. And again, in this idea, like the Iliad says, we are descended from the gods. So the, the idea is, is that, you know, you might be a Mycenaean aristocrat, you might be a new Dorian invader. Either way, by able to secure your land means that you have the final say in it. Also, what happened in the, so for example, we're going into the Iron Age, a good way of looking at how civilization redeveloped it's strange enough how the Californians um, did homesteading, strangely enough. There's a book out, and it's called, uh, wasn't it, The End of the Old Dreams? Quite a good book, and it explains how early, the early model of farming would have been like this. There would have been a few invaders, maybe, going to Greece, and then these people managed to, you know, pull the hill fort or something and stake it out. What happened is, because you're the actual owner of the place, it's not someone else, you've got an incentive to do something with that land. So in Greece, you have all these little parcels of land whereby then well, people would then eke out more of an existence from like less productive land. You'd need an olive press for yourself because you can't just go and give the olives to someone else. So in a sense, unlike Egypt, which had very little property ownership and you're just compelled to look for the fur or, well, let's say you had some sperm on it. What do you do with it? You're not going to reinvest it in your land. You don't own it. The Greeks did because by either outright conquest or keeping it, they were able to, and again, this is the crucial thing, once you own land, there's every incentive to reinvest back into it. So in the Californian example, when they were homesteading, a few settlers would go out, the pioneers, and then eventually a little town would grow up around it, and then you know, more population had spread. And we get this in Greece, whereby they end up from subsistence farming, a one-to-one -one replacement, so eventually the population doubles. And this comes up with an interesting point. We have, during the Bronze Age, you find out we call real Greeks Ionians. That's someone from like Athens. But you strange enough to find more Ionians outside of Greece. So, end time. So, mm -hmm. we've got really bad drawings now. We've got the Mediterranean world. We'll start off up here at Marseille. So, this is where that the first Greek called um, one of the late Greek colonies stemmed from. So, we've got all the Mediterranean coastline, south of France. We get to the boot of Italy, down here. The southern part of this becomes something called Greater uh, it? Magna Gracia, Greater Greece. So when the Romans were fighting people, actually, actually fighting civilised people, not barbarians, key to it, 
So then, so obviously, we've got three segments in mass, Sicily, uh, Italy. We've also got Sicily, half and half. As then we go around towards sort of like where we get Greece down here, and then Turkey and all that, and the Black Sea up here. What we find is we've got Marseille, Greater, Magna Gracia, Sicily, and then we have all along the northern coastline, all inside the Black Sea up here. Not a great, loads of little cities. Now, the question is, if the Bronze Age has just collapsed, who are all these Greeks on the Mediterranean? That's the key to this. We think some of these guys, so some of the earliest established cities in Greece, are strays enough, these colonies, which are outside, don't think for a minute were colonies like we did in the British Empire or something. This was a very different model. What happened is, like I was saying, population managed to increase from one to one all the way to like, sometimes in case, three times more. Attica's a good example of this. There comes a time we don't run out of land. Like in California when they were doing homesteading, there come a point where like, oh, we're butt up to our neighbour's land now. Well, let's try and use this less productive land here. Let's try and maybe seize that over there, no one wants it. So what the Greeks did is they, due to population increase, once the Bronze Age had run its course, these people went to settle all the way around the med. Other instances of this, so there's some that were genuine, like population increase they left. Other people settled, some called in, like around the Black Sea, these were survivors. These are people who run out of Mycenae and Greece. So there's only, in a sense, the Athenians, who are pure-blooded Ionians in this, and the other pure-blooded Ionians live around the Black Sea, and here and places. But then once you get to Levant, around here and then to Egypt, that's where Greek colonisation stops. That's where the Middle Eastern world begins. So in the Iron Age, so when the Bronze Age collapsed, obviously all of the northern Mediterranean, parts of this are available, but obviously they run into problems here, the more well-established cities. The Indo-Europeans have this problem as well. There's actually a river in Turkey. So by the north of it, they speak Indo-European, Indo-European culture. South of that, it's Semitic culture. And again, the only reason our Indo-European ancestors we really conquered a lot is because the more established people here were quite used to, you know, massive cities like that, Babylon, Syria, Antioch and places, old places that you just are not down overnight. The, another way Greeks did colonisation, and this is quite odd, um, you usually think of colony, it's like people are on your wavelength. No, sometimes what happened to these people, they'd have disagreements. Sometimes amongst your group, amongst your, what you call it, your fellow equals, sometimes you just can't get along with them. Sometimes some people are just too high energy. So these people leave and they go and end up forming their own colonies. And the idea is, is they nominally, they like, for example, Athens will send out the colony. Even though it might not be on good terms, they'll still be nominally Athenians. You still worship the same gods and you have a connection to that city that others don't. However, don't assume it's just like the city condones a colonisation effort. Sometimes this is literally half of the city riots and says, we can't deal with this, we're going somewhere else. And again, in the Greek world, another thing that's interesting is trade. It was all consensual. Nothing were ever compelled. If someone wanted to sell, buy or do any kind of trading, it was based upon two individuals. It wasn't like a grand system of this, in a sense. Because like other cultures in Egypt, everything had to go through the third world. In this, it went through you. No, I want to sell you some grain. We can make a transaction. I want to sell you some weapons. You don't have to go through a middleman. And this makes a big difference where you've got people who outright own property. There is no one above you. You are the, like say, you are the sons of the gods themselves. You are divine. It's like, you know, you've conquered this place. It's now yours. This, so in a sense, this explains like the pattern of where, you know, Greeks are on the map. This correlates, strangely enough, as all this, like, you know, Bronze Age collapse and sort of an expansion, it's when the first polis began and in the Greek mind there is nothing bigger than this there is that is the be all and end all of their society and civilization they what we think is going on with this is because why they went down this role of kind of you know, I don't want to call it democracy that comes later but the idea that whereby men can kind of decide their own fate in this time frame like you said the, the manner of warfare that would have been conducted you look at the Iliad, it's mainly like one-on-one -on -one heroic warfare, like kind of the, the warrior ethic. The practicality of this time frame would have been hoplite warfare, whereby you're not just reliant on yourself, you have to rely on some other men. So what happened in Greece, there'd be several farm owners, individual plots of land. You'd have a common cause between all of you. There'd be something that unites you. Like, for example, in Athens, for instance, there was, each area had its own little tribal affiliation. Um, other places have fratries, like groups that, you know, how do you prove you're an Athenian? Well, go and ask the fratry. They'll tell you my name and my great granddad all the way back. That's how you can prove it. The, 
Right, so this, coral, this time frame of polis, what happens is, is because all these individual blocks, there's no one above you, you're all individuals, what is a threat bigger than you? Well, you come together and you're trying to work together. And in the process of doing this, you understand that, like, well, he's got his area, I've got mine, but together, we'll work better than the sum of our parts. So, for example, like in Great Warfare, you had a shield and a spear, but the problem with this is, on the own, it's useless, because on the right side, you can stab me. And that shield's only good enough if it's locked in. So the only way Great Warfare would have worked is in groups. And this is what kind of changed the dynamic. Um, like I say, other empires still have poplar and phalanx techniques, but the Greeks took this to another level. And we think a lot of this revolves around the fact that because there isn't a centralised government anymore, it's all fractured and broken down, that literally men, like-minded men who understand we are no equals, can work together in the poplar. And again, what made this different is because, first of all, if you look at uh, the numbers of deaths in the Greek battlefield, normally 10% is what they call that decimation, that results in usually an army running away. Greek warfare could get it up to 20%. It was really bloody, very, very vicious and brutal. And it wasn't just like, we're fighting for a king or some emperor. No, you fought for your city. That's the difference in all this, your polis. So what made their world a bit different was, is instead of, some abstract thing, it was the practicality of the, your, your kin, your kith, your, your polish, your family. And that was the be all and all and end of everything. If, example, this is what the Spartans said, if you run from a battle, your sister, you have to explain to your sister why she is now a spinster. You have to explain to your parents why they will not be sold food at the Agora. And that was one of the things. Weakness on the battlefield resulted usually in your polish being captured. So it's not like, oh, yeah, the king's just lost some honour. This is life and death sometimes. And these people literally, the Greeks end up even saying this when it comes to their politics. They view the community bigger than the, the individual in this. And they come up with this idea whereby, for example, the American Constitution, the law is there to stop excess. It doesn't make you a better person. The Greek laws did it differently. They believed that by making good laws, made good citizens. So that was their idea. And again, you can trace this th thought back to Greece, whereby you have utopian principle. Like people even say it's like Marxism nowadays, whereby the idea, like, the, like left governments will do this, whereby they'll blame the world around them, not the individual. So like right wing people will say, for instance, like, well, the individual's born corrupt. You can't blame the system is in. A left wing person will say someone's born good. It's the system that's bad. And this is kind of an echo back to Greece. So even though we take individual rights and democracy is a Greek idea. You can also trace back left-wing roots back to it, the idea of a utopia, the idea that you can make people better by making rules, which, you know, that's up to the individual to argue that one. I'm just saying from a historical point of view, I obviously like, it's a very different world than we are now used to. So we're inheritors of this Greek freedom, but that's not how they intended it. So example, in the Greek world, yes, like you could argue individual things did matter, such as gaining honor and glory. Example in the Iliad, um, they say to me, why are you here, Achilles? He says, because I have to be the best. Because he knows in the prophecy, he doesn't go there, he'll live the rest of his days, but no one will ever remember him. But he knows if he goes to that battle, he will die. But he will be renowned forever. We all know his name, so it obviously worked. Didn't it? Otherwise, if he hadn't done that battle, we'd be talking to someone else. <laughs> uh, and again, that, that, the idea that literally men would all do things, not because someone told you, like say, Agamemnon, all he's doing is just facilitating, he's not compelling it, but it's your own honour that makes you go there because you have to be the best. In other words, who do you, like this, this competition, this is something the Greek world as well. And, and again, the explanation is the Bronze Age collapse allowed a world, a, a new slate whereby competition could flourish, whereby men could seize, in a sense, what's, what's theirs. You don't have to be compelled or listen to other people. And again, this goes down the train of thought whereby in the Greek world, individually, yeah, honour. So, for example, Sparta's like this. They are all an aesthetic people. They're all very economically similar. But yet, the only thing that differentiates you is your honour. You know, well, I'm better than him. I've fought more people than him. I've stood in the phalanx more than he did. And that allowed a system of whereby honour is what dictates and allows things to flourish. So, again, you're not in a world whereby, you know, you might be economically equal in some sense to other people, but it's, it's your honour that makes you pursue other things. The, so yeah, that's in a, in a sense that's that's the warrior ethic where it comes from. It can all be traced back to like you say. That's I don't like using this term, but like we call it the Western Bible. The I mean, remember who we're now? Um, 
Alexander the Great, he used to sleep with a copy of the Iliad under his pillow every night. That's how serious he took this. And again, what I find curious about the book, like I said, it's, it's good because you get a good flavour of the time. Obviously, it doesn't correlate 100% to the archaeology, but it does give us this sense of like, even though it might be clumsy at times, this idea of a world collapsing. But again, the siege of Troy would, some historians think it was probably one of the last battles of the Bronze Age. Because there's a rough time frame, we're talking 1200 BC when this whole collapse happened. And again, some people think that it's quite reminiscent of today. You have a Mediterranean world whereby you've got copper being traded, other various items of interest. I mean, you could argue it's very similar to today. It's a, it's a mini globalised world. And the world unravels in literally a, a period of like less than a century. Whereby, and again, some people have speculated that Troy could have even been one of these like battles that tipped, you know, the straw that brought the camels back. And again, this this gold, you call it, I mean, they always, the Greeks did this, and other cultures do the same. They always look at the past as a golden age. It was always better, it was always bigger, it was always more amazing than today. And again, I mean, that's just a common human defect. We even do it in our world. Oh, the 50s were better than today. And they kind of viewed everything in the past as being superior. I mean, like I said, their architecture. They claim Cyclops is built it. No, a king could literally summon 100,000 men, have the money and time to pay for it. And, you know, like I said, some of these kings, Example in Greece, even though these people are Indo-European, they're heavily influenced by the Middle East in a sense. So, for example, the architectural styles, some of their religious things, I mean, obviously it's mainly Indo-European, but there's some overlap. So what the Greeks actually claim as well, it's a funny one, they say they don't do anything original, they just make other things better. So a Greek could take your idea and improve it somewhat. And again, it's, it's kind of funny because everyone assumes like they're, they're not an innovative people in the self, don't mistake it as that, but if they, like Socrates said, he said, I don't have any original thoughts on my own, I merely make your ideas better. That's how he viewed it. And that's kind of how the Greeks were. They didn't innovate as such, but they did improve upon existing ideas. Uh, but like I said, in, in the Bronze Age, they, were, they had access to again, the Egyptian world, they had access to the Hittite world, the Carthaginian. Um, but the point is, it's, everything in the, in the Mediterranean at that time is reliant on everyone else. You can only get copper from Cyprus, you can only get tin from Britain or Spain. And you can only make bronze when you've got both together. In order, and again, warfare, you find an example like the Battle of Kadesh is a good example, whereby the Egyptians and the Hittites agreed to a peace treaty because it better for trade that way. You know, so, but what happens in the Bronze Age, again, maybe similar today, and I don't like doing this, but a um, climactic shift, some scholars think. There's about five or six reasons I'll try and cover them briefly. So, we've got climactic shift as the big be all and end all of why it happened. Problem with that is, though, it doesn't explain why certain areas survived and certain areas like went under so why did why, why did Athens survive then if that's the case you know, I suppose it's climactic shift from everyone be affected you know Athens is no different in this regard there's the other idea some archaeologists have looked especially in the Middle East they've found that certain cities uh, it's only temples that are destroyed it's only government buildings that are destroyed tax collectors yet the granaries are intact that would suggest it's an internal thing so each of these city-states, one reason for the Bronze Age collapsing could have been people had enough of this. They could have realised, wait a minute, this is a tyranny. We live in literally people thinking they are God and they're not. It could be, I mean, the good way of looking at it, Egypt, when the Nile stopped flooding, his authority went. He was no longer a God. And it could have been the same with this, whereby, you know, the straw that finally breaks the camel's back. Um, another one, and again, it sort of relates to the climate shift one. The... Um, there was loads of tribes that are mentioned in the Egyptian archives on this one, like the Peleset, the Danai, and things. Uh, and there's the Sardinians mentioned. What we think is happening because of climactic shift. So we've got internal rebellion, crop failure on a massive level, and then you've got Europeans coming in sometimes. So, for example, like the Philistines in the Bible is a good example. Uh, they're the Peleset from the Sea Peoples. Uh, they're Indo European. If you look at the name, example, Akish of Gath, uh, it's Sudawata, if you know the Indo European. Which is mad. So everyone assumes, like the Philistines, you know, or like the biblical enemy of the Israelites, really, them people, the Europeans, it's quite funny. Well, culturally and linguistically, they are, is a good way of looking at it, maybe not genetically. Uh, so, like I say, all these people, like I say, these Indo European people, Sardinians and all that, they, they ravage the Middle East and Greece. Uh, in the Greek case, they actually give a name to this, they call the Dorians. And again, history loves to do this. In the Iron Age, we have the same thing Germanic barbarians invaded the Mediterranean world. So the historians overlap that, they went, well, it must have been the same back then. So the way they're taken is like saying, 
in the Great Peninsula from the north would have come these barbarian Dorians. The, these people were very, very different in the original Mycenaeans. They were, you could argue, more simplistic, more male-driven, uh, more brutal, you could argue, because this culture, an example of this is you've got Athens, which is Mycenaean Greeks, big-headed you know, philosophers. Next door is Sparta. Uh, them people have a very different way of life. They are Dorians, even though they claim they're not, because they love playing propaganda, they love to tell the world they were, but they obviously were. But you can easily see how the culture is radically different. So in in Sparta, you have, um, you are basically, it's strange, you are born up to the age of six, your childhood ends, you're then sent to the Agorgi, where you are brutalised, you're assigned a lover at the age of six, it's pretty brutal, so you usually are abused. As a now remember, I'm not condoning this audience, I'm just explaining how Spartans were very different than other Greeks, and it's because maybe this Dorian influence, they have a, you're given a cloak, that doesn't keep you warm. That encourages you to sort of steal things. The idea is on the battlefield, they want you to be able to be thrifty. They want you to be able to borrow things, pilfer, without the enemy knowing. So some of the tactics would be you have to kill a slave and not be seen doing it. Uh, another story, I think it could be from Aristotle, I'm not mistaken. There's a story where there's a 10 year old Spartan with his cape on and he's so hungry. He grabs a ferret. Right, how hungry must you be to eat a ferret? He grabs this ferret, just about eat it. Next news, stand to attention. So he stands there, puts his ferret under his cloak. Next news, starts biting him. He stands there, doesn't care. Bites into an artery, dies on the spot. Now, we think it's an exaggerated story. We think, obviously, the person would have bottled out sooner. But that just shows you how the Spartans operate. Like, they were so austere that they'd rather, rather than they told off and beaten at attention, you'd rather die from blood loss from a ferret bite. The way the Spartans did a marriage, this is another example of how barbarian their culture were. Um, when you get a wife, you have to shave her head, leave her in a room, and make her look like a lad, <laughs> like a man. Now, to me, this is very suggestive of a little bit like the Medusa story, I'd say in this one. For instance, you'll notice that in the Spartan marriage ritual, women and the family as a whole are kind of second place in this. So, because remember in Sparta, you, up till the age of 21, you couldn't have sex, that was funny. So literally, you'd be there naked, because all Spartans were naked on the parade ground. And 100 metres away, there were a lot of naked women running around. Imagine how bad that must have been for your hormones. You know, you're, you know, from the age of six, you're being abused by someone, and yet you're seeing these women every day. But you can only marry them at 21. And the whole purpose of their culture is, is to supply men for the war effort. Their entire culture is based upon warfare. The reason is, because these Dorians invaded the uh, region was in the far south of Greece, the Peloponnesian area. They, what they did is they invaded the, was it, Masalinas, the, the, the people next door, they invaded them and they made them the Helots. Now, this is where it gets strange now because there's a comparison to this with the American Deep South. Because in the Spartan world, they was terrified every night that this slave class, that because the Spartan didn't do anything. They, they're very active, they're always military training, but they don't have a job. You don't have a career, you literally your job is to train in the in the hot light army. The, the work's done by helots, and the whole idea is this Dorian tribe invaded the people next door to them and subjugated them. Every generation this is biting in the, the backside. Because a Spartan, like someone in the deep south, would go to bed every night and be terrified that they won't wake up in the morning because some helot might have slit the throat or burnt their house down. While an Athenian didn't have this problem. So Spartans being Dorians, they sub subjugated the Mycenaean people, forced them to be their slaves, but in the process they lost some of their self. Because every night when they went to bed they thought, this might not last. And likewise a Spartan, you couldn't march 100 miles away on a warfare, because your city might be burned by a helot. So this really was restricted, so the Spartans, even though there was epic warriors, they were peerless on the battlefield, you couldn't go very far. You couldn't leave the city for longer than a few days, it might be burnt when you come back. The Athenians, strangely enough, thought they never had this problem. They like I said, they were Mycenaean survivors, they, they are Ionians. So Sparta, their neighbours next door are barbarian Dorians. These Mycenaean survivors, it's strange in Athens, they, what they do is they, they become refugee camp, in a sense. That becomes then a nucleus. The hill fort, the Acropolis on top of the, like the, the temple to Athena, that's, what, that's where everyone would hide if anything went wrong. They, basically all these refugees from around Greece, the other Ionians, were welcomed into Athens. And the weird part is if you look at the genealogies, some of the more ancient families are refugee families. 
So there's the odd, you know, I'm from the days of the Mycenaean kings, and there's other guys who are like, oh, I, I came here just after the Bronze Age. Yeah, you're an aristocrat as well. And it was very different. Ath Athens' world, obviously because the Spartans were subject as invaders, the local native Mycenaeans coalesced together. So Attica, strangely enough, ends up as one of the biggest areas in Greece. Now, it's, you know, there's bits of it that are useful, bits of it that are rubbish, but strangely enough, unlike other areas of Greece, it's very small, parcel, little parcels of land. Attica's a huge stretch, and we think this is one of the reasons why, because they, they had a different world approach, because they were the original inhabitants of the place, and these people were fleeing from Dorians, they were able to all come together. So again, the two cultures, the Spartans and the Athenians, have gone in a very radically different route. The, now again, don't get me wrong, the Spartan world had a lot of checks and balances on it. You've got two kings that can veto each other. You've got soldiers who can have a say in things. You've even got um, a group that can check on the kings. And it's, and it's very strange. So in other words, you know, it's militaristic, you could argue, like a fascistic society, more checks and balances than you could, like, I mean, the two kings system, it's, I mean, that's nowhere else, really. I've not seen that anywhere else in other areas. I don't think anyone else, yeah, if you think about it. Because well, I've only ever seen, like, fur or, like, a, a Middle Eastern king. I've never seen an area where there's two kings ruling court term, actually. And again, each one could be to each other. And so you couldn't have tyrants in that sense. You couldn't have outright tyranny. Um, again, the great word for tyranny is funny. It doesn't mean like we think today. All it means is you're not legitimate. It means you have no say on being in charge. But what often happened in a tyranny in Greece, you, you had a situation whereby, so we've gone from the end of the Bronze Age now, we're in the Iron Age, we've gone through this period of whereby these farmers coalesce into these little city-states, they all form hoplite armies. One problem that comes from this though, these hoplite soldiers tend to want more of a say than they have before. So let's say you are, you know, we're doing this, but I want a bit more, I want a bit more. And what happens is, is when the polis po uh, pol get really big, you end up with Tyrannos, whereby you end up with hoplite soldiers taking over a government. And what happens, strangely enough, is, is to, we call a tyranny today, you think it's outrageous and bad. Their tyrannies are very moderate, strangely enough. Like, they wouldn't allow aristocrats to have the full say, but likewise, they wouldn't let the pleb rule by you know, sheer tyranny of the majority. You'd always have a middle ground. So, for example, in Athens, you had like the laws of Solon, whereby moderation becomes the norm whereby you've not got the excess of the aristocracy, but you've not got the rampant Marxism of the lower orders. It's just a perfect balance. Difference between Sparta and Athens, they had a slave class. Athens had some slaves, but not as many. There wasn't that same incentive. They even said this, like, if originally when all these Iron Age communities began, they, they were very small, not very big. You don't have carrying capacity to have slaves. So Mycenaean kings could have as many slaves as they wanted, that was fine. But when there's like 20 of you in a plot of land and a river like how do you afford slaves? So what happens is in Greece, the more end up as hired hands is the way it works. So like an, uh, the Greek slave, it's not like the deep south sort of slave, like the plantation. It's more like like in the Odyssey, you know, he's working away with fellow servants. You know, he's, there's no difference almost between the servant and the king in that one. The and again, what this does is it takes us to this experience whereby we call it becomes later on, obviously we call it democracy. But for now, it's not. Don't think it's just like, oh, like today's version. It starts off like the French Revolution. In, At in Athens especially, so you've got Solon, makes these moderate rules, leaves for tenure, and then other families take over the system of rules. They know that you don't replace these rules, you just sort of be in charge and, and enforce them. The Eventually what happens is it's like the French Revolution is a good way of putting it. That's how early Athenian democracy began. It wasn't, oh, Everybody assembled on the hill and had a polite conversation. It would have been armed gangs enforcing their worldview upon other people. And eventually under that became what we call democracy. But don't think it was this very clean cut overnight thing. No, it wasn't. It was more like the French Revolution. It would have been bloody, violent, very loud. There would have been blood in the streets. It would have been like you know, different armed factions enforcing their worldview. This, so like I said, this sort of strange coincidence of history, because they've even said it's not... The way it was intended, it wasn't like this. It was just sheer chance that the Bronze Age collapsed. So if you could argue Europe would be very different today, maybe not have democracy at all or no rights, we probably would have carried on down the route to um, what, I'd, what we'd call like an uh, overbearing state where you've got like absolute monarchs as tyrants and stuff. 
The Bronze Age collapse in Greece, especially. So other parts of the world still continue down that road. Egypt and Babylon and places. But Greek ends up with this clean slate. The only thing that continues is religion. And like I said, an example of this, like the religion in, into play. Uh, in the early Mycenaean world, and a lot of old Europe, as we call it, the, before the Bronze Age collapse, like I say, women had more to say in religion. An example of this is, like I said, the Temple of Medusa, her story. She's a Mycenaean woman who wears, you find them in the archaeology, she wears with death masks, a scary snake mask. In the story, she's praying to a, uh, a goddess, here or whatever it is, and some guys run into the temple. I think it's Perseus in that case. He runs into the temple, oh, sons of Perseus. They run in and rape her. And in the story, the goddess sort of takes that on her prophetess. You know, the woman who's been devoted to the goddess ends up getting victim blamed for this. And she ends up becoming like rage unbridled, you know, like that sort of justified anger. And we think this entire story is, because I always say this, I say, unless you can disprove it from contradiction, tell me why it isn't so. So I look at Greek mythology like this, yeah, take it with a grain of salt, but I could easily infer the Medusa story as the Lord of Dorians invaded Mycenaean temples, raping the priestesses, and they then the world collapses. No, shit, I, I, I've just been praying to a god every day, worshipping him, and they let this happen to me. And that's how we think the Medusa thing happened. So again, what I'd caution with Greek mythology, obviously, take some of it with a grain of salt, but don't discount it all. Because like you say, what originally started out as Troy, as a fable, turns out now to be real history and stuff. So, yeah, we have, in a sense, just check the time. I think right from 27, not far off. <laughs> yeah, so what I'll do is I'll kind of wrap it up now. Yeah. To do this. yeah. So, the train of thought, basically, we go from, um, so anyway, like, so this is the end of it. The Greeks had two dilemmas in their life, and this is where we get this transition now. The Greeks were seeking the perfect man. They wanted to be the perfect man in everything. And likewise with the Greeks, even though they had an afterlife, it wasn't as easily accessible as you think, and it wasn't as pretty as you think. Example, Odysseus meets Achilles later on, and he's in Hades, and he goes, Wow, you're a king in Hades. And he goes, do not talk to me about that. He said, I'd rather be the lowest of the low of birth than a king down here. In their afterlife, it was either darkness and misery, or Tantalus is a good example. You reach down, the water recedes. Oh, I can't hit the grapes. And you're always thirsty, very briefly, punishing someone. Their afterlife wasn't as pretty as you'd like to think. So they have this dilemma. Um, essentially, it's a miss afterlife, and we're not from the perfect man. What happened later on as time goes on, let's say Christianity comes on the scene. And this is kind of the big contradiction. People say like Greece is the, you know, the hub of learning, enlightenment, democracy. Yet they have two unanswered questions and Christianity answers them questions. So in a sense, people, because I know some people in the proprietarian mindset would view um, Christianity as like an Abrahamic invasion. And what have you. But in the case of Greece, it wasn't. It literally people had, had, had questions and the Bible provided those answers. And you have this thing whereby in Western thought, you've got this, and again, this influences Western world completely. In other parts of the world, there was either a state or religion, in a sense. Uh, both were usually the same. In Europe, you had this very big problem. You never had one person who could take over all of Europe, but likewise, the church couldn't do it. And in this vacuum in the Middle Ages, that's where we get kind of the modern day approach to freedom comes in. Because you've always got the state, secular world, and religion, and both are competing in that vacuum between the two, is what we call modern freedom. So, like I said, from the, the Greek story of the Bronze Age to this sort of ending, I hope that's sort of explained where, as a people, and as the Mediterranean, it sort of became the way it is, and hopefully explains to you why we're here now the way we are. So with that, I have been Rick Turpin. Thank you for your time, and uh, see you next time.